So basically, I also formulate the outreach and marketing strategies for local and in, uh, overseas markets, which of course India is our biggest market, along countries like China and Tunisia. Our office also actually handles some of the key major events, including our annual open house. Actually, our open house will be in 3rd and 4th of March next year. So for those who are actually in Singapore, we have, you can actually follow by. We also organize a range of education conferences, symposiums, so because SME is actually right at the heart of the city. So every now and then, like in fact almost every month, we have a lot of lectures where we invite uh, renowned academics, politicians from all over the world. Hillary Clinton actually visited Singapore SMU about two years ago. So at SMU, we are actually even younger, we are only 17 years old. So they call us the new kid on the block, but this is definitely a very, very powerful young kid who is giving a big voice. Singapore, the National University of Singapore, Nanyang Technological University, a run for the money. So in fact, uh, based on the recent, because we do a graduate employment survey every year, this three university do a joint survey in terms of uh, the graduates employment prospects, the salary, the starting pay. We have actually taught all these categories for the past three years, which I'll share more with you later. So we then can hand over to Frank, who will take you through this presentation. Okay, so um, just to start off, um, one of the things that we have been experiencing here, especially when you're in Asia, because we do a, recruit, a lot of recruitment in Asia, and then, um, we do see a trend of more and more students choosing to remain in Asia for a number of reasons because you know the economy is actually growing so fast here. If you look at the job prospects, you know where you want to work in the near future in the next five ten years, a lot of students will ambition themselves actually staying back here to work. Um, this is actually according to a very new uh, recent paper. If you are interested, you can actually search on uh, Japan, Malaysia, Taiwan, and South Korea. We map regional student force. Um, it is actually predicting that in the next 10 years, it's probably even shorter time frame than that, that um, right now, although Asia has always been a uh, place where a lot of students are going to the uh, West for education, see more and more students who are actually staying around. Um, the recent numbers, right now, it's, um, we are estimating 2 or 3 million of degree-seeking students going yeah. abroad. But then uh, we are just attracted to about a million people to stay back in Asia uh, in tradition movements. But then uh, we are going to see a huge shift in, in the, the flow because a lot of uh, countries are using a lot of, uh, for example, if you read that, read that report, you can actually see how Japan, Malaysia, Taiwan, and South Korea are using different strategies to internationalize the, the campus. They are giving a, a very good options for seeing a lot of other students to consider. And um, just to share, last month I was in Malaysia, and then, uh, when I actually looked into one of the top high schools in Malaysia, uh, they just show this big picture of, of uh, where the, their graduates actually go. And then they will actually put up the photos of everybody who actually went abroad. And I do a count. And uh, surprisingly, um, from this one of the best high schools in Malaysia, the most number of students actually went to China to do a, one of the top universities in China. And then after that, uh, upcoming places, Hong Kong definitely because we have been promoting in Malaysia for a long time. Singapore definitely because of the ongoing relationship between, between Singapore and Malaysia. And um, surprisingly, we do see a good number of students going to places like Taiwan, Macau, which is also in the region, and then, um, and then not so surprising is uh, the number that actually go to the West, in US, UK, is actually on the decline. So this is just one observation from one of the high schools in Malaysia. It doesn't actually, actually represent the whole picture, but just to give you a sense of where the students actually are trending and when they actually hate it. Probably I can see a lot of counselors down here in the room. Um, a lot of you might actually have heard about students. More and more students are actually thinking about different places. You know, some actually think of thought about going to Japan. Um, well, probably China and Taiwan might not be on the radar of a lot of students from India because of uh, they still teach a, a good portion of them actually still teaches in Chinese. But then um, in other parts of the world like South Korea, um, in also like places like Japan and Sing of course Hong Kong and Singapore, we have been doing in India, I mean in India for a few years now that we are gaining months. But I'm um, just going to compare head to head 
what Hong Kong and also Singapore has to actually offer in a number of ways that we are going to look at it today. So um, we are first going to take a look at both places in terms of the quality of education and then um, in terms of program and curriculums, um, globalization of talent, which we see a major trend, especially this is one of the focus in Hong Kong and also in Singapore, and also the employment outcome that, that after they graduate, they what can actually do in Hong Kong and Singapore. So I'll pass on to Kao to actually touch on the overall education uh, in Singapore and also in the whole as well. Thank you, Frank. Okay, so basically we'll do a head-to-head -head comparison on Singapore versus Hong Kong in general, after which we will actually touch more, okay, we will actually narrow down a little bit to the respective universities, what CTU Hong Kong has to offer and as well what Singapore Management University has to offer. So in terms of the overall quality of education, if you look at this, this is actually based on the latest QS ranking. It's not the general ranking because we all know that QS has many different categories. So we look specifically at the international faculty component. There are actually 30 universities in Asia ranked within top 100 in the world. And Singapore and Hong Kong actually have been doing very well based on these latest rankings. There are five in Hong Kong within the top 50 and three in Singapore within the top 50. So a lot of students actually, they ask me one of the very common questions that I have is, what is the number of uh, international faculty do you have at SMU? So I'm just going to show you an example. So basically SMU, we recruit our faculty a very, very diverse and capable, capable group of faculty from all over the world. So they come from countries like USA, Canada, Australia, India, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and of course Singapore. So typically the international rate is about 70%, 30% local. And so they actually hold PhDs from a lot of Ivy League universities. You can actually take a look there from Harvard, Oxford, Stanford. And at the left over here, these are actually the six deans of the six schools in SMU. So they come from very, very different countries, including had, uh, from the top left hand side, Professor Jerry George is actually the Dean of School of Business. He's actually from the UK, actually Indian born, who actually went to the UK. And then we have professors from uh, Professor James Tang over here. He's actually from Hong Kong, China, and we have mainland China, and USA, and of course Singapore. Just uh, on the case of CDU, we when we actually first started to talk to Kyle about the uh, comparison between the two universities, we wanted to do a versus you know head to head comparisons. But in the end, we find that a lot of similarities. Uh, actually, um, we are running around the, the two universities. There's actually a lot of things that are similar. And in terms of faculty, uh, internationalization of the faculty, we are also very similar. As in. We also have about 70% of our faculty members who are not from Hong Kong, so they are holding uh, overseas nationals from more than 30 countries. And then uh, we are also home to 14 academicians, which they have a, high, uh, a very high level of recognition in their home countries. Including, we also we actually have a current field medalists, which is uh, equivalent of Nobel Prizes in mathematics. So, so that actually speaks about a lot about the faculties that are at CDU. And then um, same case and in in, um, in Singapore, um, we do all our uh, faculty recruitments worldwide. So, for example, our office also take care of recruiting of faculties. So we we have actually hold six faculty recruitment from um, we did one in. Um, we did three in US last year, and then we do uh, two in UK and one in France in just over the past one year. So we recruit faculty members from all over the world, and then um, one of the things you might actually know uh, you, if you are working in a university, um, professors in Singapore and Hong Kong they are probably one of the best paid professors around the world. So uh, if you are planning to actually become a faculty member, and in the short run, you can actually consider these two places to actually further on. Hey, just to show with you a little bit about Singapore you know, Management University, we actually have a range of very, very modern and very state-of-the-art facilities. For those of you who have not been to Singapore, if you are going to go to Singapore next time, you can actually ask. Uh, so maybe we could arrange for campus tour. So just to give you an example, we have uh, a very, very state-of-the-art gymnasium, a fitness center. For those of you who want to actually work out regularly, we have a beautiful rooftop swimming pool. 
Okay, in terms of security, we have this 24 hour security. So, especially for the girls, if you actually, um, I'm not encouraging you to go out at very late at night, but let's say if you, you actually need to go out at 2 a.m., 2 a.m., it's completely safe. Not only because Singapore has a very low crime rate, but also because our security is very tight. Even within the campus, the security of our students are the top priority. So, we actually have two libraries. Both operate 24 hours 7. We have a general library, which is the building in the center, and a law library at the school, new school of law. We just had a new school of law building uh, that was just set up like uh, this year, March. So for those of you who want to pursue law, okay, the new school of law has a range of very, very state of art facilities, including a new law library that was named after the first prime minister's wife, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's state wife, as well as a moot court for those of you who need some practice. A practical mood. Okay, um, this is actually another area that we find a lot of similarities between City US and SNU. If, um, if you take a look at both universities in terms of locations, we are all we are both in you are located in right in the city center. If you compare the land prices, I believe both places is going to be the top notch, uh, the most expensive campus you can actually find. In Hong Kong and also in Singapore, we are right inside the city center. Um, for SNU, they are they're actually right in the middle of the CBD. And then for us, we are in the high, one of the highest residential estates in Hong Kong, in Kowloon in Hong Kong. So uh, in terms of facilities, I think in overall, not only to just mention about um, SNU and CityU, um, I would say both places, both in Hong Kong and also in Singapore, um, all the government-funded universities have excellent facilities because um, the government actually generously funds all the universities. So, if you take a look and if you find the, the facilities all top-notch, I think it's, I, it's safe to say that if you look into any universities in Hong Kong and also Singapore, it's all top-notch, I would say. Um, facilities, although in a lot of places it's a concern, for us it's never been really a concern because um, <laughs> We have been updating everything in terms of um, you know, labs, we have multimedia labs, we have uh, uh, world famous designer built on um, creative media tower, um, and also libraries and student dormitories, those are all actually state of the art. And another very, very uh, similar, I would say, uh, Singapore and Hong Kong both offer our students a lot of, you know, in terms of security, you, can actually, you cannot find somewhere actually bad. Um, in I, especially in the last three to five years, I would say, um, campus security is a big issue. Probably around in the US, in the UK, in Europe because of terrorist attack. In Hong Kong and Singapore, I would say, although when we actually came here, a lot of times one of the first things that, that we saw our peers in, in other places, we will sell how, how organized and how safe their, their campus are and how well, they actually set up security posts to actually protect the students. In terms of Singapore and Hong Kong, I'd say we never really have that in mind because we have been taking it for granted for so many years. Just that all of our students, it's not an issue at all. Our students, for example, because our student dormitory is actually one of the highest residential neighborhood in Hong Kong, they just go out at night. Girls, boys, walk around. They, they go for somewhere in here to have a dessert at 1 or 2 a.m. Completely no issues at all. Then, because security is not something they actually have in mind. They, it's not something that they, they will actually <coughs> bother to, to think too much about. But we do actually have 24 hours on campus security. Not to actually prevent anybody else from outside coming into the, to the campus. But to actually make sure all the students behave themselves. Because, you know, students nowadays, we, with all the international students from everywhere around the world, they have different practices, they will go on drinking somewhere. Um, we, so we, we do actually have set some curfews based on that, to actually monitor our students within us. But then now, in terms of the whole environment in Hong Kong, and also in Singapore, it's actually very similar. So um, I just also, also to actually talk to you, uh, we, we just compared the two places with some of the traditional uh, education destinations, I think, in the mind of a lot of Indian students. Um, we did a comparison about the fees in Hong Kong and Singapore compared to 
on major destinations like Australia, UK, and US. Um, a lot of people will first think that you know Hong Kong is so expensive, Singapore is so expensive. But then if you take a look really into the numbers, we are actually this is actually a figure taken up from top universities in Hong So they did a comparison. So this uh, this is actually based on the average tuition fees and also average living costs in those few countries. So you can actually see that Hong Kong and Singapore score, uh, we are pretty much at least one third to fifty percent cheaper than most of the places around the world. And um, this is just a general comparison of what you are expected to pay as a full uh, paying international students. But then if you look at the reason why behind we are so cheap is not really because of the quality, it's actually lower. It's really because both Hong Kong government and also the Singapore government is subsidizing a lot on the international students' feed to Hong Kong. So for the case of CityU, and actually the case of Hong Kong, uh, we calculated, this is actually from University Grant Committee in Hong Kong, the general cost of education per undergraduate students in Hong Kong is about 200,000 Hong Kong dollars, which translates to about um, maybe about 27 to 28,000 US dollars per year per student. Um, but then uh, we are, the Hong Kong government is actually subsidizing about 40% of the fees of international students who are full fee paying. So even if they pay the full fees of international students without any scholarships, we, the government is still subsidizing the, the education that's actually in Hong Kong which is pretty much a similar case in Singapore as well. So uh, if you run down the numbers, they are even more subsidized than compared to Hong Kong. So they, they are about 44% subsidized. Uh, so the two settings, why we are able to provide a very top-notch or top-line education at a very reasonable fees, is not because we are we are not we, it's not because we are not actually down the standards of what we actually compare. In terms of cost, we're actually more expensive than a lot of uh, universities overseas. But it's because of the government subsidies that makes the fees very reasonable. And in terms of program and curriculum, I'll actually check um, on the case of CDU on how we actually design our program and curriculum to actually, to actually uh, and, uh, uh, face the coming education in the new, next generations. Um, for the case of CDU, I first joined the university in 2009, that's about eight years ago. Um, when I first joined, um, it was actually the start of our School of Energy and Environment. Um, in 1998, we actually first started uh, creating media, which because in any schools and any program that we believe to de that we want to develop, is actually based on forecast needs of what the world actually needs in not only that moment of time, but we based on the focus of the needs, forecast of the needs that is actually happening in five to ten years. So, and in 1998, I think that's actually one of our founding president. You know, he saw a ambition, a, a huge direction of students into the creative media scene. So that's what that's actually the time we actually started the school of creative media. In 2009, we thought that time because uh, the the China development and the environment in China, you know, it, over the past five years, you see what actually happens in China. It's the focus on the environment and also on energy. It's so much in, not only in China, but also around the world. But right now, it's the case, you know, the haze in Delhi, the haze in Beijing, is becoming such a uh, 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 huge issue. So that's actually the reason why we started the School of Energy and Environment. Back then, back then in 2009 to actually get students in that particular direction. So we started another college in 2014 that uh, we started a college of veterinary medicines and life sciences with, in collaboration with Cornell. Um, and because this, it, it, this is, uh, we also done a lot of studies that in the next 10 years, the whole Asian region, we are going to need a lot, a lot of veterinary doctors. Because veterinary doctors, you know, in um, in India, probably in your mind, you might envision students actually going into uh, doctor for the pets, but that's actually not true because the route for veterinary doctors, they actually do a lot of other things like food safety, which is such a big issue. Um, these animal-related diseases that actually translate into 
to humans. They also, because if you see, you know, SARS, you know, Zika, there's a lot of diseases that actually happens around this region. And this whole region in Asia, we are lacking of a, 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 a very recognized and also a internationally accredited uh, college in veterinary medicine. So that's why in 2014 we started this. And um, in our curriculums in Hong Kong, um, in City U, just to, to quickly run down, this is also one of the initiatives we actually started since 2012. Um, we, what we actually started in simple, in simple uh, explanations, we make all of our undergraduate students do research. So which is actually quite rare you know, around other universities in the whole world. But um, <clears throat> because the new world actually needs entrepreneurs, they need new innovations. That's why we make all of our students to make original discovery uh, during their, their uh, I think four years undergraduate degree. So no matter which field they are in, they are in business, they are in engineering, they are in humanities, they have to do research, an original research. So that's actually some of the curriculum design that they tell you that we, we are facing. Hey, there is a move on to seek for management university. Actually, a very distinctive feature of Asian universities, or at least in some of the Singapore universities, is actually a lecture theatre class, whereby we can actually easily have 300, 400, or even 500 students in the class. So it's very much unlike like, this current setting where we have a very intimate setting for these students. So basically for those lecture theatre class, what you get is actually a one-way traffic, whereby the professors talk, students take down notes furiously, and there's very minimal interaction. So when SMU was set up about 17 years ago, with the intention of actually providing a different education model. So what we have is actually the exact opposite. All our classes adopt a similar style learning approach, as you can see from the picture. So it's a very small class, it's usually no more than 45 students per class. So that means that professors actually have more time and attention devoted to each and every individual student. And also, when you have a small class, it means that there are actually more opportunities for students to ask questions, to answer questions, to give presentations. And that is the kind of direction that we want to actually move towards. So you ask me, what is the advantage of having an interactive class? Actually, from my experience interacting with students, talking to students, this kind of actually environment actually, because it takes place on a daily basis. In fact, class participation takes up to about 20% at SMU. So in a way, it actually forced them to think on their feet, to think outside the box, and to be able to share their views open and their views openly. So over the four years, students they get very practical training. It helps to build up their communication skills, their presentation skills, their public speaking skills, which are very important in the real working world. And most importantly, students get to learn how to actually articulate their views in a respectful, meaningful, and engaging manner, but never, never arrogant. So most importantly, when we see all this kind of education model, we feel, do feel that it is extremely beneficial to Asian students. I don't know about other countries in Asia, but in Singapore, in general, students, because they come from an Asian background, they are told not to question the professor. They are told to actually, oh, keep your views to yourself as a form of respect. So students in general are very reserved, they are very passive, and they are very quiet. When we had a lot of year one students that I deal with, initially they came in, they were very mean, they were, very, they were not very confident about themselves. One of the biggest satisfaction I had as an educator was seeing all those students actually transform themselves to become very bold, eloquent, and articulate individuals. Okay, before I go on to my next slide, I just want to share an anecdote, a personal experience, because at SMU we organize a lot of conferences, dialogue sessions, and symposiums almost every month. So about a few, a few months ago, we had an education forum that looks at the future of education and work. So one of our panelists was this uh, lady from Mumbai, Ms. Uh, Nandini Jayaram. She's actually a head of Google Asia Pacific, overseeing the recruitment for Southeast Asia and Asia. So as a moderator, I asked her a question. Uh, Ms. Jayaram, what is, one, the, what, is, what is the biggest quality, what is the biggest trait that you look out for a potential graduate, a potential hire, when you hire students? What is the most important factor to you? And surprisingly, she told me that she rarely looks at the GPA or the co-curricular records. But I'm not encouraging you all that, okay, the grades are not important. And you want to make a guess, what is, what is the, the one quality that she actually highlighted? That she looks out, I mean, for, for a big company like Google, excellent plus, one of the best companies to work with in the world. And you want to make a guess? The what? 
creatively, okay, that is one, but she actually told me that the biggest quality that she looked out for is actually students with this multidisciplinary knowledge and interdisciplinary expertise. So increasingly, we are aware that there is this growing demand for students with very, very diversified portfolios and expertise. So which is why SMU, we actually devised and designed our curriculum, not that it's just, not only for it to be innovative and interactive, but also for it to be highly holistic and flexible. I'm just going to give you an example. SMU, we have six schools, not many schools, we only have six schools. Business, accountancy, information systems, economics, law and social sciences. We have about 43 majors across the six schools. So what students can do is that they actually, most of them, pursue a double major. A lot of the universities in the, in the region say that, okay, you can do a double major. But usually all those double major programs are pre-packaged, meaning students can only do business with accountancy or finance or economics. But at SMU, we have absolutely no restriction. Students can feel free to mix and match, choose any two majors from the six schools out of the 43 majors with a total possible combination of 350. So they are given absolute autonomy and maximum flexibility to craft their career options which actually, in terms of uh, churning out group results, actually during our annual survey, a lot of, a lot of the employers told us that oh, your students are actually very diverse. You can have students uh, having a core major in marketing, and maybe a second major in information systems, or a student with a core major in legal studies, law, but a second major in accounting. So it's actually very common. Actually, there are just too many examples we need to understand you in terms of the kind of causes, the kind of programs that we have that aim to equip students with this multidisciplinary exposure but I'm just going to highlight one, which is the SMUX at the left, which is actually our crowning achievement. It's in fact an award winning scheme. Basically, it's a range of electives whereby students can actually choose to work on to solve problems. These are not hypothetical problems, not problems for your Harvard business case review. So usually the problem with all those Harvard case review, they are very, very good, very, very prestigious. But most of the time, all these case studies happened many years ago. Or they happen in countries that are the contexts are very different, so there is no direct relevance and impact on the students. There's no resonance. But for this SMUX, students work on problems identified and encountered by local companies or international companies based in Singapore. It could be like LVMH, Louis Vuitton wanting a new marketing campaign, or Google wanting a new technological solution. So students, instead of hiring consultants, they actually approach SMU and we make this into a series of electives for students to take. And what's most amazing is that they actually get to work with some faculty members as well as the employees from the affected company and after one semester, they present the findings and recommendations to the company. A lot of them, they actually get hired, offered positions before graduation because of how well they did in this module. And the most impressive, or rather I think the most interesting thing on this is when you think about uh, working in group projects, you think about students coming from the same course, the same school, but typically for here, we have students coming from Okay, a very typical example of a group project, you have a student from School of Law, a student from School of Accountancy, a student from School of Social Sciences, a student from School of Business. So each of them will actually contribute to a particular aspect by applying their own respective discipline, knowledge and expertise. So in a way, students get to network with one another and learn how the other discipline work. Globalization of talent. Okay, now I'm going on to the very important criteria of globalization of talent. Just now when I spoke about Ms. Uh, Nandini, the first quality that she's looking out for is actually multidisciplinary. The second one, anyone can guess, is actually not related to this slide. Okay, so she said that she's actually looking for students with a global perspective, with a, a global citizen, students with this international exposure. So they actually increasingly, employers are looking out for students who are able to work, understand how people from other countries work and think, they are able to actually mingle and interact with people with different nationalities. They are able to assimilate into different cultures effortlessly. So with that in mind, SMU, Singapore, in fact, all the other universities in Singapore and Hong Kong, we do offer a very eclectic range of global exposure programs to students. Just using SMU as an example, we have over 231 overseas university partners in 15 countries. So you have no line of you yeah, know, spoiled for choices. And it all depends on the program. So for instance, we have very good tie-ups with Wharton, some Stanford for business programs. And let's say for, for people who want to go to Oxford, we have a very strong connection to the social sciences area. So students, they go there, usually it's one semester for six months, no extra tuition fees. And one very important thing is that we don't grade them. 
whatever box that they get is not accumulated through it doesn't it does not constitute the final GPA. So it's either a pass or fail. Because we want students to really get involved, to enjoy, to immerse in the overseas experience. And for those who do not want to actually go for an international exchange program, because some students tell me, I'm already coming from India to Singapore, I'm coming from Hong Kong to Singapore. It, that way is already actually a form of overseas immersion. So I don't really want to leave campus for too long. We have a variety of options as well. One of the most popular options among students is something called a study mission, whereby a group of SMU students, they visit an overseas company. So last year we had students visit the Silicon Valley to visit the startups. And just a few months ago, they went to Sweden to visit Kia. They actually meet up with the employers, the students, the entrepreneurs, to learn how they work, what are some of the best practices. And they come back to present their findings in the form of a report. So this is actually very interesting, a very, very meaningful experience for the students. We also have some short-term exchange programs. These two, they're, they're quite a range, but I'm just going to share two very, very interesting ones. There is a Sino Singapore undergrad exchange where the students go to actually exchange in China for two weeks. So, and then they come back to Singapore for another two weeks. So basically, uh, we all know that other than India, China is actually one of the biggest economies. So this is actually, in fact, despite the language barrier, a lot of students from India and the US, they actually do sign up for this one. Alternatively, they can do a summer study program, which is a four-week Credit bearing summer programs in one of the two universities, including the University of British Columbia and the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. Yeah. <clears throat> for, for the case of you, I think we are very much on the same page that in Hong Kong, when we do surveys to our employers year after year, what they actually look for is actually students who have participated in exchange programs. Um, <clears throat> We do send, we, we actually send, you know, um, target is actually send 65% of our undergraduate students on exchange. And uh, you, you might think, you know, students in terms of their perspective, 65 is it like, um, okay, maybe two in three students can have a chance, you know. This is actually not the case because a lot of students will choose not to, as what actually Cal shares. Um, a lot of students who come from overseas to Hong Kong, they already have some kind of overseas experience. But, um, they might choose the way we actually see it, you know, in terms of students, especially in their undergraduate years, when they actually go out there, global exposure in a very short time span. Um, even, not even like most of our exchange is actually one semester, which is close to half a year. There are actually some summer exchange that runs for one month. Um, all those we actually see an immediate change in the students. So that's why we are promoting it heavily. Basically, we have 350 partners all over the world, so if they wanted to, most of them can actually get a place somewhere else. We also we actually went to the extent that we push our students out. We even international students who are coming in, we give them our subsidies if they want to go out. So there's actually a funding for the students to actually go out on exchange, apart from the fact that they do not have to pay for the tuitions at the other side. And we also have a lot of uh, global work experiences. We Sometimes pay our students to actually work overseas. So um, every year um, we have close to about 600 students who are doing internships all outside of Hong Kong. Although you know inside Hong Kong we still have a lot of internship opportunities. And other than that, we also have service learning. We also have uh, things like uh, field studies, and a lot of them are actually heavily subsidized by the Hong Kong government. Apart from that, um, the approach at CityU. Um, we want to truly globalize a lot of our, our students. Um, we have a few joint bachelor degree programs that we organize. The biggest one is actually the one we work with Columbia University in New York. So in this particular program, students actually spend two years in Hong Kong, and then they spend two years in Columbia in New York, and they will actually graduate with a standalone degree degree and also a Columbia degree. So we have run it for five years. And then we saw all the graduates um, that actually come through this program. They are they are really the top notch people. And then um, the other two in the currency, we have one with National Taiwan University, and then also in Germany, in terms of creating media, we are partnering with Lafayette University. So we have a very same approach. So it's like a two years plus two years. So this is another trend that we encourage all of our students to have a global exposure. In terms of employment outcome, well, I think this is also one of the hottest debated topics among graduates in India. They, you know, when we meet counselors, 
in India, one of the first things they will actually ask is, oh, do I actually get placement after I graduate? Do I actually uh, get placed into internships? Do you, will you actually find a job for my son after he or she actually graduate? Um, the answer, in the, I think in Hong Kong and Singapore, um, just take a look, we actually compare the unemployment rate in a uh, few city destinations in US, UK, Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore. You can see we have been on uh, a very stable in terms of economy. Uh, that um, Singapore is even lower than Hong Kong. We have a, in Hong Kong it's already very low because three point two percent this year is close to everybody actually getting a job. In Singapore, basically the job is actually looking after you. So in these two places, we have a very simple approach. We do not place our students. We get them. You know, we do not actually give them the fish. We give them the fishing rods for them to actually look for their own job. And then in doing that, um, in Hong Kong, because the Hong Kong whole, the, the whole setup in Hong Kong, um, you know, Hong Kong is actually a very international hub, and it is actually a home to three thousand seven hundred MNCs, and then they are actually having their regional regional headquarters and offices based in Hong Kong. So after any international students who graduated from universities in Hong Kong. They are free. The Hong Kong government actually allowed them to stay in Hong Kong without any working visa for the first year. So after the first year, you are free to stay on to find a job. If you find a job, um, you can go on to do it without any working visa until probably after your probation. You finish your probation, the government will actually do a working visa for you. And working visa in Hong Kong is so common. And then after that, um, another uh, uh, strategy about the Hong, the Hong Kong government actually favors our local government international graduates. It's, if you spend a total of seven years in Hong Kong, including your undergraduate years, you will be given a permanent residence in Hong Kong. So um, so let's say already four years you, have, you you study in your undergraduate, and plus one year visa free, so that makes it five years. So you only have to work for two or two to three years in Hong Kong to get a Hong Kong permanent residence. And the good thing about it, I think if you compare it, because we did, we did comparison with Singapore, the only the only plus things about Hong Kong in this area is that we do not force our students to have any bonding, even if they receive any scholarship. So they are free to go back to anywhere, they are free to go to postgraduate studies right after the graduations. Okay, uh, we're running a bit short of time, so I'm going to make this quick. So in Singapore, actually, I uh, just want to highlight a part that for students who, who choose to actually enjoy a subsidized rate, which is actually about 44% cheaper, there's actually a, a regulation by the Ministry of Education that actually stipulates them to actually sign a tuition guarantee, which means that they will actually have to work with a Singapore registered company for three years. So let's say if it's a company but it's based in the US or based in India, it's still, it's still applicable. So however, forever, however, in a very rare instance that students cannot secure employment shortly, which is really, really rare because the employment rate is almost up to 94%. The 6% are those who decide to actually go back to their own home country to help their parents in their business or actually pursue their postgraduate. They are actually given a one-year long-term social visit pass, which are enabled to stay in Singapore, something like visa free in Hong Kong. So people actually use this time to actually find job opportunities or, or to maybe take a little longer time to consider their future options. So likewise, in Singapore, there are more than 150 international organizations and more than 7,000 MNCs operating in Singapore. Okay, I just want to show you, uh, I mentioned very early that we have this joint graduate employment survey conducted by the three top universities in Singapore, the National University of Singapore, the Nanyang Technological University of Singapore, and SNU. So this is not figures that we made up. You, you can actually Google Singapore Graduate Employment Survey if you actually want real Proof. Okay, so actually Singapore Management University, despite being the youngest university, we have taught all these four categories. Number one, in terms of employment rate, 94%. The other 6% mainly people who actually decide to pursue their postgraduate studies. 54% of students receive offers even before graduating. Some people would say, would, would be like, how is that possible? So just now I mentioned about all those SNUX projects, all those internships. Our students tend to overperform, they impress their future employers so much that actually even in year two, they actually offered a job. And 51% actually received between two to six offers upon graduation at this point of time when the global economy is not doing well. I would say this is very impressive. And all of these offers are actually from top-notch consultancy firms, banks, some of the big accounting, big four. 
And the gross average starting salary, this is not in US or in rupees, it's actually 3,722. So you actually have to have times it by, I think the latest conversion rate is 49. So you times by 49, it's quite an impressive figure, I would say. Okay, I'll pass it over to Frank. Okay, um, so for the case of CU, uh, we see a little bit different in the uh, graduate outcomes, probably because uh, right now, from the places we actually recruit our students, from uh, a lot of uh, uh, international students from China, from India, from Korea, uh, they just don't think about working right after their undergraduate degree. So uh, a lot of them, we do see that uh, actually a great number, 41% of our students actually go on to get a postgraduate degree either in Hong Kong or uh, UK or US, which is a, it's a big trend. Because uh, in, in our friend, we can actually set a, a requirement for them to work after that. And then uh, the other, 40, about half of them, they actually choose to work in Hong Kong. And then uh, we also see an increase in terms of uh, the trend of the students who return to the home country for employment. Those are actually uh, mostly students who are from a very advanced cities. Like we have a lot of students from places like Beijing, Shanghai. They, you know, there's so many opportunities in Asia. And even though, like a lot of those students who are actually coming in, their family is probably a little bit more well off. They have connections, so maybe their father, their mother actually have these positions ready for them after they graduate, so they actually grab them back home. So this is actually the, the graduate outcomes the surveys that we see that the uh, now we in very rare cases I would see we, last year under the survey, um, no close to ninety nine percent of our students within half a year actually find somewhere to go. Either they go back home or they find a job in Hong Kong. Seldom, actually less than 1% of the students actually still looking for a job after half a year. So, so employment, I think as I was actually shared with uh, you, uh, in the case of Hong Kong and also Singapore, we are very similar. Basically, when you graduate in Hong Kong, graduate in Singapore, if you want to find a job all the way, it's not a worry at all. Most of the students have jobs to actually choose from, two to six, probably a figure. And then uh, once we have this mentality of culture, they let students know that we will not place, we will not find a place for them. They will actually do it on their own. So most of the students will do it half a year ahead of time. So they will actually find their own job. They will find multiple offers before they actually graduate. And we are, we actually set up uh, a team in CDU and also they have some similar setup in SMU to help the students write resume, how to actually polish up themselves in terms of interviews, to prepare them for them to actually find a job on their own. So um, I think time is actually uh, running out. Uh, we do actually have about 10 minutes for Q&A. So uh, both myself and Cal will be actually answering any questions. If you will have questions that's not specifically to the two institutions that we are representing. You can also try to ask us. Now, now because prior to me joining CU, actually I spent two years in Baptist universities and other universities in Hong Kong. And I've also spent about five years promoting Hong Kong's higher education overseas. So I do actually have connections. Um, if you want to know something outside of CDU uh, in Hong Kong, basically I have some figures to share with you if you have any questions. Probably uh, Cal advice for myself as well. You also have a lot of data yeah. on it. Information about the and you want to know a little bit more about that. Please feel free to ask. I have one question that a lot of times when we talk about Singapore, like Singapore is Example like CDU, 
we only we can a maximum of international students, we can only take 250. And that actually comes from all over the world. So um, selectivity, it's it's one thing that we look a lot on because you know right in the start we say that because the government is subsidizing the places. So so we do tend to you know we, we are still both very Asian-minded universities and governments. We do actually care quite a lot on, on scores, so sad to say in a way that we do, we do actually see a lot of talented students who are scoring lower. Um, in some of the subjects, for example, we can see that we assemble students with lower scores as things like art. We have creative media who look at students' portfolio rather than the score. Although, at the end of the day, they still have to maintain a pretty good score to actually get it. Not too bad, you know, if you are in the 60s, and a little bit more difficult. But then, uh, just to ensure that they enter the universities, they can actually complete the very competitive program that we actually offer now. Okay, I'll just add on. Actually, at Singapore, our, our Ministry of Education, we do have this scheme called the DA scheme, the Discretionary Admission Scheme. So, especially for SMU, more, more so for SMU, uh, every year about 10% of our international student sports, which is about 20, is actually reserved for students who do not necessarily meet the minimum requirement, about 90, 91, which is actually the norm for the Indian board exams. So, we actually do look at it holistically. We try to look at the admission as holistic as possible. We look at the uh, on top of that, students will actually submit their testimonies, their sporting achievements, their whole curricular achievements. However, even within India itself, it's very competitive. We have easily up to four to five hundred students, and every one of them have good grades. So, in order for us to really justify, you want to be give you the seat when your grades are like be, be far below actually the minimum requirement. It is not easy for us to justify. So, typically, even when we look at all these factors, it's usually for really, really, really. Let's say if your, your, your grades are not on up to the mark, it's really for really exceptional students. For instance, you're actually a national sports person, you actually contribute to Singapore, maybe you represented India in badminton or stuff like that. So that is really for the really outstanding ones. And even so, the, the kind of um, score that they, they are they're getting should not really digress too much. So probably, let's say, if you're maybe 80 something, 81, 80, 81 to 85, that's still possible. But to be honest, 60 something is, is really a bit of a challenge because we try to actually maintain, actually, we have to actually maintain the caliber of the students. But increasingly, Singapore has uh, recently set up three other universities on top of the, I would say, the three more known ones the Singapore University of Social Sciences, Singapore University of Design and Technology. Actually, for the more technical courses, I would say that they are, they are subscription, they are admission criteria is less stringent. So if you're actually interested to study in Singapore, but Perhaps you can actually, there are, because we are promoting SNU, but we are also promoting Singapore. So there are other options in Singapore, especially SUT. I don't know whether you guys have heard of it. Singapore University of Design Technology basically specializes in engineering, life sciences. I would say that the entry criteria is significantly lower than SNU. Yeah, for the case of CU, we also have, actually, just to write on that, um, we also have a standard sports scholarship. So for those candidates who you do think they have a promising Sports persons, do we actually start in specific scholarships for sports? Because in, in, in the city, we wanted to internationalize the sports teams as well. So that we, we only started it last year, that we allow students who are on their minimum entrance requirements academically to come in on sports scholarships. So that's actually something all we need to address to issues. I think here, or you go by the percentage? Um, you mean the IB, IB curriculums? Um, for the case of CDU, I can actually share that uh, different programs is having different uh, requirements because, you know, some more, a little bit more competitive, we have programs. We, uh, we have made a minimum of 36. Um, we also have some programs that's less competitive. We offer it, we do actually offer it to students who are displaying about 31 to 32. But the very one of the credit is probably the minimum that the A programs from us will actually take. As for us, some of you are actually pretty similar. For different programs, the requirement is different for IB students. I would say in general, law is the most competitive. Usually we take into at least 40. But for the other schools, minimum about 36, 37. But like what Frank mentioned, there are some courses that are actually more technical in nature. For instance, we have an information system course. 
which is actually essentially about the business analytics things of uh, maybe using technology to enhance the banking sector. So you learn things like cybersecurity, computer app, coding. So all these more technical skills where we do accept students who have like shown a demonstrated aptitude and really genuine interest and passion in the subject, probably about 32, 33, we still do have cases like that. Scholarships in Hong Kong is actually very generous. Although the Hong Kong, Hong Kong government is actually giving a lot of money, but um, most of the public funded universities, one of the things that we are not short of is probably money. <laughs> um, for example, in the case of CDU, um, we do have our own academic scholarships, and that academic scholarship is actually not government funded. We actually raised it from donors. And um, the amount that uh, I just, I just wrote a paper to ask for funding for the coming year. Just an example. Um, next year, we are looking at uh, 15 million Hong Kong dollar as a scholarship for all of our international students over here. So, so that's a huge amount of money that we, uh, we sponsored about. Uh, last year, we, we actually did sponsor about 40% of our international students. So a very, very good part. I think especially the good part from India actually got a lot of scholarships from us. So, so that's actually something good that, that um, if there are good students, we uh, never show you know, if you, they're, they're good students, but um, finance is a, is, 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 a, is a thing that actually bothers them, and it's actually not a big problem. Um, so, not just your I'll share a little bit first. So for SMU and for NUS and NTU, we all look at uh, the final score, whether it's your CBSE, your ICS, or your IB. So for, uh, for but uh, on top of that, we also look at one of the four: SAT, IELTS, TOEFL, or ACT, ACT. So typically, students will ask us what you prefer, and we always tell them that for SMU, at least for SMU. And also, I would say maybe I can speak on behalf of NUS and NTU. Generally, we do have a preference for SAT over the rest. Because we, we have this belief that SAT is actually much more rigorous. It's a better test, better assessment of the student's competency. So in terms of the SAT, typically the average grade is about 1350 to 1400. But uh, for the writing part, you need to have at least an average of 650. For the, for the case of CDU, um, we actually meet students on final score as well. So what we actually give them, because students will actually apply, they will apply with a the score. So we will actually give a conditional offer. So that will actually base off the final scores. We also give a conditional offer. Um, we are also basing the final scores for scholarships as well for us. So um, they will actually have to perform pretty well in the final scores to actually be eligible for any kind of scholarships. Just adding on to the last, last part of the conditional offer. Okay, while well, SMU we don't offer any conditional offer, but when you sub uh, submit your predictive scores, for those really outstanding ones, we do year mark them. We arrange for early interview. So for instance, you only get your results in May or June. We actually arrange for interview in February. So however, the results usually actually is positive. Most of the time, 80% is positive. But for because of policy reasons, we don't review the results to you until you submit your final scores. And if it's, let's say, within the same range, plus one, minus one, plus one, two, minus one, two, we will let you know within two working days. It's actually basically to expedite the whole procedures. We actually do encourage people to submit their predictive scores and go for the interview. Because if you don't do so when you submit your final grades only in June, the whole procedure could take up to one month, which could be a long waiting time for students. Okay, I think our time is actually out. So feel free to grab myself and I'll we'll be here after the conference. Thank you.